I have a lovely new waistcoat, as you can see, as you may notice, but that's not the only new thing at the moment. I'm also going to be starting a new approach to some of the storytelling. At the moment, how I've been doing things has been I get my patrons to vote on a topic. I'll tell a story about that topic and then I'll analyze the topic a little bit. What I'm going to start doing now is I'm going to have bonus stories that relate to that topic as well. The, this video is a very good example, in fact. The last topic I covered was Down. And in the analysis of Down, I mentioned that he was characteristic of the Phantom Rider motif that is very common in the province of Munster. And I mentioned two other characters who fit into that motif. Those were Ross O'Donoghue and Garrod Irla. So I'm going to be doing a bonus story on each of those. And this week's will be about Ross O'Donoghue. On the shore of Loch Lean in County Kerry, there sits Ross Castle, which was built by the O'Donoghue family, who were chieftains of that area for many, many years. A one of their most famous leaders was a man named Ross O'Donoghue, who the castle, strangely enough, was not named after. A Ross O'Donoghue was a wise and a just king. He was a fierce and a courageous warrior. And he was a kind and a caring husband and father. And that might be thought to be enough for any man. But it was not enough for Ross O'Donoghue, who also trained and studied to become a cunning and powerful wizard. And you may think, with all that cunning, that power, that strength, that courage, that Ross O'Donoghue would have had very little he feared. And you would have been right. But there was one fear that did grip his heart intensely. And that was the fear of growing older. And so he dedicated much of his life to study to trying to find some elixir of youth, some potion to preserve his vigor and his strength. But to no avail. He created a library in one of the towers of the castle, and he filled it with books and potions and herbs taken from all over the world to help in his quest. And still, he found nothing. And as he grew older, he grew more desperate, more obsessed. Until one day, he locked himself in the library for 49 days and 49 nights. He did not leave to eat. He did not leave to sleep. Until finally, he emerged. He went through the castle in search of his wife. And finding her, he said, My love, I think I've done it. I think I've found it. I think I know the secret of eternal youth. But I need help, my love. I cannot do this on my own. And you are the only one I can rely upon. Please, will you return with me to the library and help me in this task? And his wife, well, she was delighted to finally see him again. She had been so worried about what was happening to him, what he was doing in that tower for so long, all by himself. She was only too delighted to go back with him to the library and to help him if she could. They sat down in the library, and Ross O'Donoghue explained to his wife, My love, what I need to ask you to do it is not something I consider lightly. It's a terrible thing, but you are the only one who can do it. I need you to take the sharpest knife you can find and to cut me into the smallest pieces you can manage. 
I need you to throw them into this cauldron and to leave the tower, bolting the door behind you. And to not allow anyone, not even yourself, to enter for 49 days and 49 nights. When that time has passed, you can come back in. And you will find me whole again. Restored and rejuvenated and forever young. Oh, don't know whose wife. She was horrified at this idea. She loved her husband dearly, and the thought of causing him any harm, it disgusted her. Had anyone else asked something like this of her, she would have thought they were mad. But she trusted her husband so deeply. If he said this was the solution, if he said this was the secret, and she believed it. And so, nervously, she nodded her head and said she would do the task he had given her. But unfortunately, Ross O'Donoghue did not return his wife's unshakable faith in him. He knew that if she did not carry this out perfectly, he would be dead and gone forever. And so he decided to test his wife. He pulled out an ancient, evil-smelling leather tome. And he said to his wife, When I read from this book, it will conjure sights and sounds to horrify and disgust you. You must not react. You must not make a sound. If you do, I will be taken from this place and will never be able to return. And as he began to read, spectral images and terrible sounds poured forth from the book. They surrounded O'Donoghue and his wife, filling the library. Images of horrifying sights, mutilation and torture abounded around them. And O'Donoghue's wife, she remained still and silent, unblinking, careful not to make a single sound, until she was presented with the image of her only son lying dying and suffering upon a table. And at that, she let out a single desperate sob that was enough. That one small sound was all it took. Some unseen, irresistible force pulled O'Donoghue from the room. And his library and his horse from the stable, they vanished. You can still see O'Donoghue's library and his horse at the bottom of Loch Lean, on days when the water is clear and the sun is bright. On the 1st of May, every seven years, O'Donoghue rides forth on the back of his white horse to survey his lands and make sure all is well. Having attained the immortality he always wanted, but not in the fashion he had wished. Losing his freedom, being confined to the other world at the bottom of the lake. And all because he did not trust his wife as she had trusted him. <laughs>